The left is always inclined to look on the grim side of things. Always inclined to look on the grim side of things. The cup is always half empty. Until you point out, it. look, it's half full. It doesn't look so bad. <laughs> Welcome to Political Ginger Vitus, the crazy and zany podcast for progressives who need a laugh. I'm your hostess with the mostest, Andrew Stewart, and this week we're going to try to put a smile on your face and maybe a few thoughts in your head. war machine, they will follow your example, and if the workers of the world stand together, the war can be stopped. One hundred years ago, the Bolshevik party led a revolution in Russia that overthrew the Russian Empire and established what became the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics. Yes, we are marking the 100th anniversary of the Russian Revolution today on Political Ginger Vitus. I'm your host, Andrew Stewart. In honor of this special event, I decided that we would talk about history and the issues that are not necessarily given as much attention when discussing the Russian Revolution, particularly in relation to national liberation and struggles against white supremacy. So today we're going to have several interesting guests who are going to share their insights on what the Russian Revolution means in connection with the work they do today in challenging both historic paradigms and also white supremacy. My first guest today is Yegveni Fix. He is an artist that is based in New York City. He was born in the Soviet Union and his work is what he calls post-Soviet. And he has done several projects over the past several years which have focused around the intersection of American culture and history with the Communist Party and international communism. We are on the eve of the 100th anniversary of the Russian Revolution, and I was wondering first, as an expat Russian who is living in New York now, what your thoughts are about this centennial. I mean, it's a, it's a definitely very complicated year. I mean, uh, to you know, to think about the centen centennial, um, you know, it's heavy. Uh, a 
lot of a lot of thoughts you know um, that comes to mind. Um, and I guess you know myself and a couple of other people, you know, artists and um, curator uh, Marsha Chlenov and Anton Ginsburg, you know, the show that we put together in New York, we kind of try to uh, express what we think about the centennial, you know, through the show, or we were trying to kind of figure out how um, the centennial could be addressed and um, and we felt that you know there are certain stories mostly personal stories or individual stories of the of the first couple of years of the revolution is something that that we should not uh, should not forget that we should uh, try to uh, try to remember or try to recollect uh, common I'm not sure if it's you know Totally common, but the common uh, opinion that I that I hear among Americans, among, among Soviets, uh, um, you know, people all from elsewhere, is that you know there was there was this revolution, 1917, and then uh, and then Gulag, so, you know, that is right after that, right? So the revolution followed by you know, destruction of every kind and uh, you know horrible. Uh, you know, impossible experience for everyone, and we in this exhibition, you know, Russian um, Russian Revolution, the contested legacy uh, in New York at the International Print Center in New York. We were trying to look at the stories, individual stories that that you know paint a different picture. That there was some hope, and there were real some real. Uh, achievements the first couple you know the first couple of years of the revolution and, you know, we still understand that you know it was mixed with the, with the civil war and a very bloody civil war and there were some repressions going even before Stalin came to power but still there were those you know achievements that we want we don't want to forget and those achievements are internationalism and um, um, uh, you know, uh, liberation or uh, emancipation of women, and uh, kind of some some type of proto gay liberation. Although we cannot say that it was a true liberation, but there were some seeds of a, of a liberation there. That future liberation that might have de developed uh, had not Stalin came to power and uh, put an end to all of those processes of uh, liberation or emancipation. Right. So in America, at the time when this revolution happened, it really shook the world, as John Reed said, and it, uh, like in the rest of the world, created a whole new political uh, tendency that impacted American history in a significant way. And uh, you've been doing artwork around uh, the Communist Party USA and its membership previously. I was wondering what you uh, take away from that work. Right, right. Um, so about 10 years ago, I did my first project about the history of CPUSA, well, actually, you know, present of CPUSA as of 2007, and then next project was about the history of CPUSA. Well, I, I mean, as a post-Soviet artist working in uh, in New York, uh, you know, I was trying to figure out how can I, you know, continue to practice my craft as a, as a Soviet educated, late Soviet educated painter, uh, realist uh, realist painter, in the, in, the, in a new, completely new historical. Um, Historical era and a new geographical location, a completely new environment, and uh, uh, so kind of through that I came to doing a project, portraits of American communists, contemporary American communists from the CPUSA, and uh, I made about thirty portraits um, uh, overall, and um, 
I, I met people from the party. I asked them, can I come to the office? Can, can you sit for me? Can I pay, paint your portrait? So not everybody agreed. It was a long kind of pro process to get people, uh, you know, to, to, to gain some trust. And once people saw some of my first portraits that I painted, of the, you know their comrades, you know, uh, and so they, then they kind of more people allowed me to paint them. Um, but you know my my interactions it was it was a conversation. I painted at least I started most most of the pay, uh, paintings portraits in the office of the CPUSA office in in Manhattan, and then some of the portraits I finished in my studio later on. Um, my my takeaway was, you know, it's um, uh, and I think it show it shows in the in the paintings. It was kind of ma mundane existence, kind of mundane office work, mundane everyday, um, uh, you know, work for the cause or for the job. You know, it's, it's, I'm not sure. So there are different, you know, different could be different interpretation. But it was definitely, it felt like the, uh, the, the heyday of American communism was definitely in the past. So, so when I painted those portraits, you know, everyone was, uh, you know, shopping. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking uh, figuratively, right? <laughs> not uh, not uh, folks in the office, uh, CPUSA office, but just in general, right? The, the Russian uh, um, society. You know, the Russians, the new Russians uh, were shopping, Americans were shopping. It was 2006, 2007, so that was still before the 2008 crisis. So anyway, the economy seems to be okay for the most part. Anyway, so it was kind of a, it was a, um, um, kind of contradiction. I felt, you know, working into Office of CPUSA, uh, you know, from the street, you know, the, the stores, and uh, you know, the American life unfolding as as it was. Um, science fiction and the history of socialism and uh, the history of uh, mm -hmm. science fiction that was created in the Soviet Union is really fascinating for me because of the aesthetic and the aspects related to just the imagination of where people were willing to go in terms of the thought process. And I was wondering uh, if you had any insights in terms of be it Russian science fiction films or so Soviet science fiction films like um, the uh, film Solaris, or anything along those lines. Um, and unfortunately, I, I don't um, know much about. I mean, of course, I've seen uh, Solaris and other films, but I'm not sure if I know much about the uh, Soviet um, science fiction um, kind of um, uh, cultural production. Uh, but but you know science I think definitely after after the war uh, since the Khrushchev era um, was was pretty central I think Soviet culture and you know idea of progress uh, was uh, very much linked to the idea of scientific progress maybe not so much well I guess social also but uh, um, I think it was maybe even more. Uh, kind of profound in the, you know, the scientific pro uh, progress as I mean, a substitute of social progress, which, uh, you know, the country was definitely stagnating, uh, but, you know, uh, the space program was, ha you know, still happening and uh, uh, some achievements, um, you know, are, were happening even though in general, the, the Soviet technology was definitely lag, lagging behind the, uh, you know, American de technological developments as far as um, as far as everyday technology, mass consumption technology. But um, yeah, I'm not sure if I uh, 
if I have much to say on the, on the side, you know, science, the science fiction side. What do you think that today's Russia is looking like as with regards to how uh, it's evolving politically and how Putin is impacting its political system? Because uh, I know, for instance, the left is rather split around the uh, question of whether uh, Putin is a progressive force in politics on a glo geopolitical global level or if he's deeply reactionary. Right. Um, well, I mean, it's, um, you know, it's, it's a hard, uh, yeah, it's, it's a hard question. Uh, I mean, it's, um, uh, you know, I, I read a couple of days ago, I think, on the Russian on the Russian website, the media source. You know, people were saying that um, that the author was was saying that the, the you know Putin regime uses a lot of or tries to to use a lot of uh, you know Soviet symbols and Soviet um, kind of um, so Soviet um, you know aesthetics. Um, uh, to to justify itself, and that uh, that in fact it, uh, Putin's regime has nothing to do with the Soviet so Soviet system, and uh, the, 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 there is there is no pro, you know promise of equality in the, in in you know in the in the Putin's Putin's regime, and you know promise of equality still was big, very basic at the core of the Soviet. Of a so you know Soviet ideology or Soviet promise, um, so um, so I'm I'm afraid uh, I, I'm afraid uh, you know Putin definitely you know not not uh, not helpful for for progressive causes you know anywhere mm. um, you know it's uh, you know highly conservative uh, you know state and. Uh, uh, you know, quite aggressive state for the most part. Um, so, you know, maybe some temporary alliances could be made, but but uh, there is nothing, you know, long range. Uh, you know, nothing. You know, uh, you know, no, no, nothing good will come. You know, out of uh, the alliance of the left with Putin. I think it's. Uh, it's a mistake. So one of the other projects you did was mailing uh, copies of the imperialism, the highest stage of capitalism pamphlet by Lenin, published by the Communist Party USA to different businesses. And I was wondering if you could just talk about uh, what the fruits of that project were. Yes, um, so it's a project from over 10 years ago, and it was called Lenin for Your Library. So I mailed uh, 100 letters, uh, 100 books by Lenin, Lenin's work, Imperialism, the Highest Stage of Capitalism, as you said, published by CPUSA, by, by the publishing house uh, of, of uh, CPUSA. I mailed it out to... 100 global corporations, and then slowly I started getting responses from them. Uh, so out of 100 copies, uh, 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 60 out of uh, 100 corporations, uh, uh, about 60 corporations uh, did not reply to me at all. I, I have not heard back, and uh, so the book is lost, the, the copies of the books are lost, they probably tossed it in the garbage. But then from about 35 companies I heard back and uh, I got uh, letters of acceptance. And if it's an acceptance letter, they would uh, thank me and very often they would spell out in the letter the title of the book. Thank you very much, Mr. Fix, for donating Lenin's, you know, VI Lenin's book, Imperialism, the Highest stage of capitalism to our uh, library. So if it was an acceptance letter on the, on the company letterhead, 
uh, company is stationary. And in case the book was rejected, they would send it back to me, usually also with a letter uh, stating the reason for not accepting it, either um, a narrow focus of their library collection or, uh, or stating kind of uh, uh, the fact that they don't accept uh, unsolicited gifts or they don't accept, uh, you know, anything from private individuals. So it, it was kind of a fun project. I, I, when I started it, I really didn't know what to expect because, because you know, I sent it. I thought, well, maybe I, 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 I won't get any responses. Um, but then, um, uh, you, know, resp you know, responses uh, started coming, uh, you know, coming back to me, the uh, rejection and acceptance letters. And it was an interesting kind of um, an interesting experience to to see, to hear the corporate language of those letters at the same time some personal uh, individual uh, sensibility or subjectivity of, of people who were you know uh, writing to me on behalf of those corporate employees of the corporations. Yeah, and the project was pretty much all uh, completed by 2006, and then it, it came out as a book, uh, you know, with all those rejection acceptance letters. What, in terms of uh, this past election, were your reactions and feelings to seeing someone like Bernie Sanders, but also Donald Trump, and their movements that ar developed around them as political bases emerge in American politics. Right. Um, I mean, it, it's, it's um, you know, I, I kind of saw it from outside. I still not quite, uh, you know, even after so many years uh, here in the States, I still you know, feel a little bit as an outsider as far as American politics. And, uh, um, you know, it's... Uh, uh, you know, it, it, it felt like something is brew, brewing in the American society, and uh, um, you know, so so it, you know, it felt definitely that you know, socialism became 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 much uh, more accepted by the mainstream American um, kind of American voters, right? Or People thinking politics that you know socialism is not a, you know dirty war, world world, but uh, you know uh, for some people I guess it still is. Um, but yeah, I mean um, uh, it it was exciting, it was very interesting to me. But um, I'm not sure if I can you know uh, if I really understand what you know uh, uh, the the reasons of uh, San, you know Bernie Sanders. You know, um, I guess defeat, right? We can say. Right. Yeah. What are some issues that you find yourself more and more grappling with as an artist, or trying to articulate and deal with as someone who frames himself as a post-Soviet thinker and artist? Right. Um, well, uh, for the for the most part, I mean, so most of my work, most of the work that kind of, of mine that people have seen or know. So it's the last 15 years or so, right? So like uh, earliest work is from the mid-2000, mid early 2000. And at that point, I was really interested in kind of trying to understand what happened with the with Soviet history in relation to, let's say, American uh, history uh, in the Cold War, but from a point of view of a kind of a generic post-Soviet subject, right? Let's say, you know, a subject that doesn't have, a, you know, a specific ethnic identity or sexual orientation, so kind of generic, generic post-Soviet subject, I would say. But then in recent years, I, I, you know, I started doing work that is more specific, that's more specific, that, that tries to kind of divide or subdivide, or kind of complicate the uh, the uh, the image of a post of a post-Soviet subject, 
or, or, or Soviet subject for that matter. So I've done a uh, in the recent couple of years, I've done project about Soviet LGBT history or Soviet Jewish history. Or um, I did a project about representation of Africans or, or, uh, or black Africans and African Americans in um, in uh, Soviet visual culture, right? So I, I wanted to kind of make it a little bit of a, I don't know, maybe a more sophisticated um, image and try to present a more sophisticated image of what, uh, what you know, the Soviet uh, experience was for different groups. And that uh, it was not always in a uniform experience. Okay. So in that, I think that's that's been my recent work, and uh, I think I'll continue doing some work on on that in that direction. Okay, um, because it's very fascinating for me as both someone who has interests and observations about the uh, way that our discourse continues to be framed by some of these Cold War issues. Um, for example, we just had in the public broadcasting of the Ken Burns miniseries about Vietnam, a rather extended public dialogue that was centered in many instances, it seemed, around was this war justified or is there any sort of justification for saying, for example, at the beginning of the film that it was starred by good men who had good intentions and that sort of thing. Um, in terms of specifically African American and uh, Africana studies, we see a certain uh, amount of insight is beginning to develop about how the Cold War impact the fight for civil rights in America and, for example, the uh, prominence of individual thinkers like W.E.B. Du Bois or uh, Richard Wright or any of these other figures. So um, I find it fascinating to talk with somebody who's looking at it from the other end of the tunnel, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yes, for sure. Yeah, you know, I mean, um, uh, so I, I've, I've collected, you know, 200 images um, in which, you know, Soviet artists were depicting Africans and African Americans. And it's, uh, it's a really very complex kind of body of images because you can, you can see, uh, uh, you know, some genuine um, humanism in, in some of them. Right, genuine humanism, you know, portraiture of individual people, you know, por uh, portraits of kids, and so on. Then, then you have you know propaganda images where where Soviet you know artists commissioned by the states would produce images of internationalism. Uh, and then there are some images that are kind of borderline racist, and you know, it's not, it's not clear whether the stereotypes were channeled somehow, uh, you know, uh, from the West. And uh, um, and um, perpetuated in the in the Soviet space, or whether uh, they were already in the Soviet space before the revolution. So yeah, it's you know complex legacy. But um, but uh, uh, when I show these images uh, to American audiences, it's it's usually quite a shock because you know to. Uh, for Americans to realize to what extent the issue of race in the United States and then later in South Africa was 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 uh, was important for Soviet you know for in the Soviet Union um, and um, uh, and to what extent the Soviet Union was making making uh, the issue of racism in the United States for example an international issue right something that the U.S. really um, wants to kind of hush hush, you know, hide it, right? So that it's kind of internal American matter that should not be made uh, an issue for international forums. But um, 
you know, Soviet Union was very persistent in making it a, an international issue. Right. And, and, and in so doing, you know, make, you know, I think making, uh, you know, really, really helping the grassroots you know, um, movements in the United States, the, the, maybe if, if not the civil rights movement itself, but, but certain, you know, certain environment, right, in which um, certain ground, you know, which I think was helpful for, for you know, later gains in civil rights. What are your thoughts on the way that the Communist Party uh, USA impacted American film? Because I know you've done some work around the Black Blacklist per- previously. Um, I, I did one project on, on the history of... Um, um, uh, the history of the, of Hollywood and kind of communism in Hollywood. I'm not sure if you saw it. It's uh, uh, it's called the Song of Russia. Mm-hmm. It's a series of paintings based on uh, films that were made in in the U.S. in Hollywood during the Second World War, specifically in 1943, 1944, when the alliance. Uh, when there was an alliance between Stalin and Roosevelt and Churchill. Um, and um, so those movies are quite remarkable because they, uh, they show uh, a very positive image of Russia, of the Soviet Union. In one of the movies, um, Stalin you know, figures very kind of prominently and uh, kind of this... Uh, a fatherly figure who leads his people to uh, in the fight against Nazi Germany, um, and um, so one of the movie was called Song of Russia, and the other movie was called Mission to Moscow, based on um, on a memoir of a, of American the ambassador ambassador right Davis mm-hmm. Joseph Davis. Um, and the third one was called North Star. Um, so the movies were made. Apparently, they were, if not sanction, sanctioned by the Roosevelt administration, but at least, you know, very warmly received by the administration. You know, to uh, to uh, improve the public, uh, the, the image of Russia, the image of the Soviet Union, the image of Stalin, and the American public opinion during the Second World War during that, that alliance so that American people would feel that the alliance with Stalin is uh, not such a bad thing for the purpose of fighting Nazi Germany. Uh, but then, of course, you know, after the war, uh, the creators of those films, many creators of those films were blacklisted, and uh, I think the two, uh, the two screenwriters who wrote the script for for uh, Song of Russia, there were two German communists li- living in Hollywood, exiled, you know, G- German communists uh, you know, living in uh, in Hollywood during the war, and I think they were blacklisted, if I'm if I'm not mistaken. And actually, there is a book um, called uh, the Song uh, Ayn Rand and the Song of Russia. So Ayn Rand actually testified against uh, uh, testified against the creators of those of that of that particular movie, The Song of Russia, and she, uh, you know, right? She, she you know, she, uh, that, that's why she t- that's when she told her famous line that uh, uh, those movies are propaganda. Uh, those American movies made in Hollywood are pro-Soviet communist propaganda because they show smiling Russian children, smiling Soviet children. And that's you know, impossible. Soviet children cannot smile. Mm. They do not smile. Um, and, uh, yeah, I mean, from what I understand, it, you know, it was, a, it was a, quite a blow to... To, to a lot of people in Hollywood, and uh, uh, Julius, uh, Julius Dassin, uh, one of the um, filmmakers, uh, actually, filmmakers of film noir, right, kind of American 
Uthur uh, Lawrence had to live and uh, spend the rest of his life, I think, in, in, in Europe. Um, yeah, but, you know, but those movies, do, you know, it, it's funny that uh, before the Second World War, uh, Andrew, can you hear me? Yes. Um, it's funny that before the Second World War, there were a lot of movies in Hollywood defaming the Soviet Union, right? And of course, after the war, there were tons of movies defaming the Soviet Union. Um, uh, but then in the middle, there were those two years of, of pro-Soviet pro movies in Hollywood, but then later on, that, you know, those movies were seen as um, kind of a, a um, um, kind of a dark change in the history of Hollywood. Because, right. Because, you know, those films were apparently propaganda. Although uh, they were done, you know, in, to help the war effort. So there's a very ironic contradiction in the fact that while Stalin oversaw the communist movement and the Communist Party USA reached its highest level of popularity under his auspices, on the one hand, you had a profound amount of repression and return to great Russian nationalism uh, and return of anti-sodomy laws under his governance, but then simultaneously in this country, the Communist Party USA ended up being a significant center of activism and early gathering for what would eventually materialize into an independent gay rights movement. And you've touched on Harry Hay, but there were many others too that were originally in the Communist Party. Mm. Yes, absolutely. And it's definitely a huge historical, you know, contradiction or, you know, kind of very, you know, complex legacy. And in, in Harry Hayes' memoirs, he talks about, you know, him getting the idea for gay liberation in the, in the U.S. Um, while teaching Stalin's book on, on, um, on, on nations, Marxism and the National Question. Where, where Stalin defines what the nation is, uh, common territory, common economic relations, common language, and common psychology and culture. So according to Harry Hay, he, in the 40s, he realized that uh, Stalin's definition of a national minority applies to American gays. At least some of those... Um, some of those... Uh, um, American uh, gays met at least, I think, three um, criteria according to uh, Harry Hay. They had common language, common economic relations, and com common psychology and culture. So they constituted a, a minority group, and that could be, and that would, would, you know, in his mind, as uh, somebody who comes from communist background, enough. Uh, ide you know, ideology, enough theory to go by and to, to base his activist, gay activists on. Uh, um, uh, I, I'm, I'm not too familiar um, with other um, early um, gay activists who came pro from the communist background. Maybe you, you can mention a few for me so I can... Well, it was... Know. In Hollywood was a lot less... Uh, doctrinaire and beholden to the leadership of the Communist Party because it was so removed from New York and it had a much different uh, kind of milieu because the types of people who were joining up uh, the Communist Party or fellow travelers, they had uh, a lot of middle class people and a lot of people who were uh, in particular, the fellow travelers. Are you familiar with that concept? Of course, of course, yeah. Okay, so a lot of fellow travelers were joining the Communist Party as this sort of uh, 20th century, uh, for lack of a better term, Catholic alms purchase. Like, they, <laughs> it eased their guilty consciences to be 
rich if they were in the Communist Party and supporting the working class in that fashion, wow. is the argument of some people. Mm -hmm. And so you had uh, these, I mean, Hollywood as a geographic location is, it's this outlaw town because it's founded as a place to break Thomas Edison's patents where, and Edison in New Jersey was infamous for hiring thugs and getting people either beat up or burning down their houses mm. because they broke his patents. So they're going to, it's all these people who are going to break the law. And so you have people who are outcasts and people who are from the Bohemian and from the theater world and from the kind of off the beaten track, rather outlaw sort of attitude and mm. orientation that defines the first 35, 40 years of Hollywood's existence. And so, uh, you know, sexual uh, behaviors that went against the norm uh, homosexuality was the least offensive because um, Charlie Chaplin was, for example, infamous for his affairs with young women, like underage girls. Mm -hmm. And um, the amount of homophobia that went on to inform the uh, hounding of uh, Hollywood and California communists was pretty profound and pronounced. Mm. And so there's a lot of, it's difficult to say, uh, you know, so-and-so as an individual personality was in the communist party or was a fellow traveler and was gay because there's a lot of, uh, gray in there, but there was a significant number of, uh, gay men and women who found mm. the communist party to be this location where they could, for lack of a better word, let their hair down and have a drink with some friends. Mm, mm, I see. So, do you have any other thoughts you wanted to make in closing? Um, well, I want to invite you to see to see this exhibition in, in New York. I think, uh, you know, I'm, I'm pretty proud of it. I think it's... Uh, it's a it's a new take on the on the Russian Revolution from the standpoint of individual liberation and uh, um, and actually you know speaking of LGBTQ history I think this is probably the the first exhibition to, I mean in history dealing with the legacy of the Russian Revolution that includes the LGBT question as part of an art exhibition. Uh, that deals with the uh, legacy of the Russian Revolution. Then comrades come rally, and the last fight let us face. The international unites the human race. My next guest today is Professor Gerald Horn. He is one of the most brilliant scholars of African American history working today in the field. And we sat down to talk today about the meaning of settler colonialism in relation to both the Bolshevik project and its historic role in American society and how it impacts current day attitudes on the progressive left spectrum that perhaps need to be revised. So, Dr. Horn, we see in historical literature the notion of a horn thesis and i was wondering if you could describe this connection between anti-communism and jim crow and the larger anti-colonial struggle well basically <laughs> this has been articulated not by me but by eric mcduffie of the university of illinois for example where in looking at some of my earlier work he suggested that I was putting forth this thesis about the connection between, first of all, the Red Scare in the United States post-1945 and the existence of the socialist camp, which 
began making legitimate accusations about human rights fiascos on this side of the Atlantic, as the United States was doing the same, and therefore the existence of the socialist camp creates objective pressure for the United States to try to get its own Human Rights Act in order by easing the most egregious aspects of Jim Crow. Likewise, uh, something similar is unfolding across the Atlantic and Africa, that is to say, as black Americans began to surge against Jim Crow, they were empowered to then protest more strongly against colonialism. And likewise, as African nations were assisted by the socialist camp in fighting against colonialism, they were empowered simultaneously to protest against Jim Crow. And so there's a kind of virtuous circle taking place. I think that's what Eric McDuffie was referring to. Now, we see in this 100 years since the Russian Revolution a growth in that period of the anti-colonial struggle for the uh, global South as it is now known. And I was curious about your feelings or your reactions to major events that came out of the Russian Revolution. Well... I would respond in a number of ways. One, I'm writing a book on the liberation of Southern Africa as we speak. And there is no doubt that the liberation of Southern Africa would have been, shall we say, more difficult but for the assistance of the socialist camp. It's not only the fact that the militants were being armed in Southern Africa by the socialist camp, but also militants were being educated and having their propaganda printed, for example, in the German Democratic Republic, that is to say, after National Congress literature printed in the German Democratic Republic, not to mention uh, pressure at the United Nations. So the liberation of Southern Africa, for example, would have been much more problematic and much more difficult but for the existence of the socialist camp. And I haven't even mentioned, for example, the dispatching of the Cuban troops to Angola, circa 1975-1976, and the uh, battle of Puto Cunevale, approximately 13 years later, where the Cubans, the Namibians, and the South Africans, and the Angolans defeated the apartheid army on the battlefield, which set the stage for the liberation of Namibia itself in 1990 and the first democratic elections in South Africa in 1994. As a matter of fact, you can go further, as I will do in this book, and make an argument that one of the problems faced by South Africa as we speak is that the socialist camp did a lot of the heavy lifting with regard to the dispatching of apartheid, not least the Cuban troops. And so when the ANC came to power at the same time that the socialist camp was being disintegrated, their major prop of support was collapsing as they were seizing the reins of power, which is one of the reasons why F.W. de the last apartheid leader, said that he decided to negotiate as the Berlin Wall was collapsing in uh, November 1989. So, those are some of the connections. One of the other uh, anniversaries that we see this year is the Balfour Declaration and... Um, I'm curious about your feelings. You just briefly touched on one anti-colonial struggle that found its sort of resolution, allegedly in the, at least Western press, around the period of the Bush-Clinton administrations. The other one, a few years later, was the famous photograph of Clinton, Rabin, and Arafat on the White House lawn shaking hands at the Camp David Accords. And so I'm wondering what you think can be said because the uh, Eastern Bloc was no longer capable of providing the type of support that might have hindered implementation of neoliberal policies in these two zones of struggle. Well, first of all, the Balfour Declaration of early November 1917, with 
obviously the height of opportunism. We have one nation, London, promising to the nation Zionist movement land that in a sense was still controlled by the Ottoman Turks as a way to gain leverage over the Ottoman Turks, which apparently worked, that led to this alliance between the nation Zionist movement and London, which then led circa 1947-1948 to the Nakba, the catastrophe, the dispossession of the uh, Palestinian people, and the inability or unwillingness for the international community to press successfully for the completion of the original United Nations resolution that called for a Palestinian state to come into being. Well, obviously, one of the problems now, if you scan the horizon, is that the Palestinians are facing a very difficult international situation. And number one, Israel has fairly good relations with China. In fact, there have been credible reports about Israel leaking sophisticated U.S. technology to China. Number two, Israelis have fairly good relations with Moscow. Mr. Netanyahu has been in and out of Moscow on a regular basis. Uh, obviously, the uh, Netanyahu regime has fairly good relations with France and Germany. Germany has supplied submarines to Israel, which, by the way, that whole deal might lead to the downfall of Mr. Netanyahu sooner rather than later, thank goodness. But France, you may recall, also supplied some of its most sophisticated aircraft to Israel um, early on. So the Palestinians are facing a very difficult international situation, made even more difficult by the retreat, the erosion of the socialist camp. And I chose those particular words because despite the fact that the bourgeois press is dancing on the grave with the Soviet Union, the fact of the matter is, is that October 1970 did lead to a general crisis of the entire capital system, revealed in part when Moscow helped to support the Chinese revolution. And then we know that under the Nixon administration, overtures were made to China on an anti-Soviet basis that, quote, worked, unquote, in the sense that that was a factor in the collapse of Moscow. But that turned out to be a poison shallow for the imperialist camp because the payoff to China was massive and direct foreign investment, which has created this juggernaut, which as we speak is in the passing lane. I, I trust you've been paying attention to the rather historical press uh, with regard to Mr. Trump's visit to China. For example, the article in the New York Times, I think it was just yesterday, that suggested that sooner rather than later, all advanced technologies will be dominated by Beijing, including green energy, quantum computing, artificial intelligence, robotics, and that the United States and Canada will be left as exporters of raw materials, petroleum, waste paper, etc. So, A, we can say that the deal with China, quote, didn't work, in the sense that it did not preclude the general crisis of capitalism, and B, as things stand now, unless this encirclement policy that Mr. Trump is pursuing as we speak, knocking together this alliance of Japan, India, Australia, and I'm afraid Vietnam as well, that unless that encirclement strategy works, well, then we can say doubly and triply so that the uh, Nixon trip did not work very well. One, I hope that I was sufficiently articulate. Right. One of the events of particular interest, at least for me, is the Congress of the Peoples of the East at Baku that was attempting to build a gathering from the different uh, Eastern elements of the former Russian Empire along with uh, East Asian populations. And I was wondering uh, what your feeling was on that with regards to it being part of a long line of uh, efforts that include the efforts of, say, W.E.B. Du Bois at that, during that period. Well, when I think of that, 
because of recent events in the United States, I immediately only think of Cash Kent. And I think of the trip of Langston Hughes to Uzbekistan some 80 odd years ago. And I think of his writing at length about the battle between socialist modernity and religious fanaticism. And I think about what happened in the late 1970s and under U.S. President Jimmy Carter and his national security advisors, the big net presented. There was a U.S. intervention in Afghanistan to try to destabilize a left-leaning regime. And then, of course, the Soviets intervened on behalf of that left-leaning regime in order to blunt the U.S. intervention. And then that led in turn to the United States uh, whipping the flames of religious fanaticism in Afghanistan, uh, sharing a trench, if you like, with uh, uh, Osama bin Laden. And then, after the routing of the left wing in Kabul, the United States then uses Kabul as a base to help to spread religious fanaticism in Afghanistan's neighbors, including uh, Uzbekistan, uh, to the point now where the craftiest foe that U.S. troops are facing in Afghanistan 16 years after the intervention of 2001 is the Haqqani Network, which is dominated by Uzbek. And then I think about what happened in New York just about eight or nine days ago when a man is accused of running a truck and driving it in lower Manhattan uh, through bicyclists and other pedestrians. Uh, I was disappointed, although not surprised, to see that there was not that kind of historical reflection in the mainstream press in considering the latest act of, quote, terrorism, unquote, on these shores. So... In recent years, we've seen a uh, discussion of socialism without all the Cold War taboos, particularly stemming from the Occupy movement and uh, the campaign of Bernie Sanders. But one of the things that I've noticed that I've found rather disappointing and pretty disturbing in many instances is this notion of the working class, whenever you see imagery associated with that phrase, it's usually this kind of white gilded age imagery of Europeans and it fails to give recognition to African American struggles during that same period. Um, I was just curious if you had many thoughts on that. I know it goes into the realm of uh, signifiers almost. Right. I just finished correcting the page for the book that will be out in January. The apocalypse of settler colonialism, the roots of slavery, white supremacy, and capitalism in North America and the Caribbean. This book is a prequel, a precursor, if you like, to my Council Revolution of 1776. In this book, I argue, I might say, anger about how I think many of our friends even have misjudged the alleged progressive character of settler colonialism in North America, which of course led to genocide and mass enslavement of Africans, and then led to a revolt against London when it seemed that London was baffling on those two key points. And given that, we should not be surprised at all, it seems to me, by the election of a man that many are calling a fascist, Donald J. Trump. It seems to me the inevitable result of the seeds of settler colonialism and white supremacy being planted hundreds of years ago, and the failure and or inability of so-called progressive people to figure out what's going on. I mean, as I've been exemplified by what you just articulated concerning this image. One of the things I've seen previously written about is the fact of Cedric J. Robinson's book, Black Marxism, having a influenced your scholarship. Um, I was wondering if that was a correct description and if you could elaborate on your feelings about that book since Robinson's death. Well, the therapy is the Lord Benson. I knew Cedric Robinson. Cedric Robinson was a friend of mine. But I can't say that he influenced my scholarship. I do think he was trying to say something important not unlike what I just articulated, 
which is to say that, like, one of the points I make in my uh, book to be published in January is that in assessing the Enlightenment, for example, many animals, even those who consider themselves left, they have their head in the cloud. That is to say, the retreat of religious intolerance is almost seen as a product of people thinking up in their heads that this is not a, a good idea, as opposed to the fact that in terms of trying to overawe and combat rambunctious Native Americans and rebellious Africans, the colonizing powers could not be choosy about those who were picked to be settlers. They had to overcome religious difference, Protestant versus Catholic in the first place, and then, believe it or not, Christian versus Jewish in the second place, in order to get those who could be defined as white settlers to fight and occupy the land of the Native Americans. Now, I think Cedric, being a political scientist and not a historian, he was trying to get at those points, but I think that uh, the best way to get at those points is through a deep dive into history more than anything else. As you have these books coming out, uh what are your feelings on black politics and black struggle as they continue to evolve and develop under this new administration? Well, it's a mixed bag. I mean, for example, look at what I just said about what was happening under the Carter administration in 1978, 1979, with regard to intervention in Afghanistan. An earth-shaking event. We're going to look long and hard to find any of our mainstream black commentators saying anything about that. Uh, positive or negative in 1978, 1979. I think this is the product of what we were talking about at the top. That is to say, this Faustian bargain that was made in return for anti-Jim Crow concessions, among other things, the African-derived population it's still clear of some policy issues, even though uh, because of our oppressed status over the centuries, we have been forced into the global arena. But now, since we were supposed to have this kind of citizenship, we, like everybody else, just leave that to the State Department. And I think that that particular deficit uh, still exists, still obtains to a certain degree. I mean, I, I noticed that some of our friends, said on Twitter, are trying to stampede blacks into this whole Russia gate, Russia mania, you know, Russia over the election. But if you dig a little deeper, I mean, black people use Facebook and Twitter, but we we better than this nine to one. So to say that ads on Facebook and fiddling around with Twitter help to swing the election, it, it, all it does is really reinscribe the whiteness project. Because all they're talking about is whiteness, they don't want to come out and say, is this not you know, considered kosher in 2017? Uh, which reminds me, of course, that those 63 million people who voted for Donald J. Trump, and, and, and by the way, I, I think many of our friends in the left, including some of my friends literally, I think have been much too uh, milk-toast in terms of doing a hard-nosed, hard-headed analysis. On the one hand, they'll say they're rumbling with fascism, which is fair enough. But on the other hand, give us an analysis of 53 million people. I mean, why are they opting for that? What has left them to that historically? And don't give me this nonsense about, oh, you know, there's a $72,000 median income. That doesn't sound like working class people to me. I guess these people don't know what certain auto workers make, what certain steel workers make, what certain teachers make, what certain cops make, what certain military guys make. I think that unless we take the blinders off of our eyes, we don't have a lot of time to discuss these issues in the internal camps in Yankee Stadium. What is your own feeling in terms of, I think this is almost bordering on a type of ghastly question, but Settler colonialism as a project and as a long-term, multi-century uh, status quo in this country, at least to my feeling, is kind of 
the senior partner in comparison to fascism in terms of fascism, at least the German variety was very adamant about trying to borrow concepts and efforts from the American project. Uh, That's right. And so this notion that fascism is ascendant is kind of like missing the mark a little bit. And is it neo-fascism? Is it settler colonialism amplified? How, what do you feel about that? Well, I think that if you look historically at fascism, the idea was is that it was a response of a certain wing of the ruling class to the idea of a resurgent left. Now, you don't have, with all due respect, you don't have a resurgent left in the United States. The trade union in the private sector represents maybe 7% of the labor force. There's a Supreme Court decision right around the corner that if it goes through, and it looks like it will, it's going to destabilize the public sector unions as well, particularly AFSCME and SEIU. So how can one credibly then talk about fascism under the class of Dimitrov analysis if there is no apparent surge by the left in unions? I think that that's where settler colonialism comes in, and you can see obviously, that a country that not only endured genocide against the indigenous people and mass enslavement of the Africans, that, A, if people can rationalize that, which many people on the left have done, you can rationalize anything, and B, if you've had mass enslavement and genocide, it should not be surprised that there are seeds of fascism baked into that culture. And I would say that in some ways, this these fascist trends, to use that term, is to respond, believe it or not, to the Obama president and the fact that people felt they were losing their country, as they put it, even though, as we know, it wasn't as if Obama was ruling as a lesson, as best he was ruling as a country, but it helped to tap into the deepest, darkest recesses of the settler colonial mind and the settler mind with regard to the black scare. And therefore, it seems to me that anyone who enters into this, this fray, enters into this debate, has to give an explanation as why in 1991, David Duke, an avowed fascist, got 55% of the Euro American vote and running for governor and barely lost. And B, why is it that in the Deep South, nine out of 10 Euro Americans vote against? Well, they, they vote for the GOP and vote for the latest political expression of the settler class, or T, why until 24 hours ago, a, a Christian crusader of the 11th century, speaking of Warren Moore, was on a grind path to be elected senator from Alabama. Now, of course, he just got accused of statutory rape, which Donald kind of, which him to drop out, but he can still win. I was looking at the Birmingham News this morning. He's still having a fist. So, once again, I think it's, it's a mistake. People need to take off their blinders and get away from this. Even the bourgeois historians, look, look, look at Michael Carmen with the frame of coup, which totally dismantles this idea of the U.S. Constitution being some great leap forward. It wasn't even a great leap forward for a lot of poor Europeans, not to mention 1776 and stuff. I mean, I think the left, they, 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 as I said, unless we pull up our block, we don't have a lot of time to discuss this. In the internment camps, if we're not careful. Right. Now, the idea of a resurgent left, um, media, I think, plays a large part in this because um, when I feel I want to study the enemy side of the fence uh, and you go onto a website such as Breitbart or Alex Jones's InfoWars or whatever. Uh, kind of crazy madhouse you can find on the internet. They have this very complex, constructed delusion about Black Lives Matter, Occupy, and uh, certain elements of the progressive caucus of the Democratic Party coming after their guns. And, uh, you know, it's a construct that would make Louis Althusser blush. Um, what do you think can be seen and said in 
an objective sense or realistic sense, I should say, about the Sanders campaign occupy Black Lives Matter, the opposition to fossil fuel expansion and these different movements that have brought class back into the discourse over the last several years? Well, obviously, it's a, uh, it's a breath of fresh air, just like the elections on Tuesday were a breath of fresh air. But one of the things I've noticed about the U.S. left is that there seems to be a lot of official optimism. They tend to, the U.S. left tends to violate the dictum of Adam McCarthy Brawl about tell no lies, claim no easy victory. The U.S. left tends to overinflate its own importance and the strength of its forces. And that leads to customistic results. <laughs> you know, general overinflates the strength of this person. Uh, I think that, for example, in terms of the election, if you look at Virginia, for example, where the winning Democrat won by about nine or ten points, and Hillary Clinton took the state by five or six points. If you look at the, the red blue map, of course, the most of the state is red. Is just Northern Virginia, a bit of Richmond, and Tidewater is blue. And I think that what we have to focus on it reminds me of the um, football coach, Vince Lombardi, who said that when he was game planning, he focused not on the opponent's weaknesses, but their strengths in terms of trying to battle. We need an analysis and a strategy that acknowledges that going into any national election, the political expression of the settler class, the Republican Party, has a stranglehold on the old Confederacy, other than Virginia, and of course not Virginia because of demographic changes. That is to say, the heavy Asian, South Asian population in particular, in Northern Virginia, but from North Carolina to Texas, they have a stranglehold. And then in areas where the Native American question is still strong, the Dakotas, Montana, Wyoming, Idaho, with the settlers have a stranglehold there, even East Florida, where the Clyde Bundy, Clyde Bundy, Bundy case is taking place. And so we need a strategy and analysis that's going to attack on those fronts and try to understand. I'm not trying to sweep everything under the rug and act like, you know, we're in the first of Stephen Power, even when from Kansas, like this guy in Virginia, who's basically a centrist, says, oh, I mean, I'm glad he won. But, uh, and I'm glad that there was a mass turnout. But given the fact that many of our liberal friends are the ones who really are trying to stampede us into this conflict with Russia, and Many of the people who applauded Donald J. Trump when he launched missiles against Syria in April 2017, then who was acting presidential, and who would not be opposed to a new Cold War against China and the encirclement of China. So I, I, I think we need a much more sober analysis, a much more realistic analysis, an analysis that doesn't inflate our strength and recognizes where we are. So one of the most uh, closest in proximity uh, examples of perhaps a left that maybe we should be taking some inspiration from is Cuba. And I was wondering if you had any thoughts in regards to the direction the Cuban revolution has been taking it over the last few years and what the U.S. left could learn from it, maybe. Well, a couple of points. One, as you know, the United States has just tightened restrictions against travel to Cuba and are targeting the Cuban military in particular. But secondly, there's going to be change at the top, at least as of now, in a few months with regards to President Raul Castro stepping down at the age of 84, 85. And so that's going to be a very sensitive moment. Obviously, Castro at all are not leaving the leadership of the Communist Party. But those transitions... Uh, obviously, we have to monitor very carefully. I think, I think one of the things I, I, I draw from the Cuban Revolution is an ability to analyze concretely the political situation where they were and the 
developing a strategy based upon the concrete analysis of where they were. And I think it, it's just like I was saying with the United States, these folks in the United States, they haven't even figured out they live in a second colonial regime. <laughs> I can't even figure it out that their so called revolution was a counter revolution, which is why it led to genocide, mass enslavement, overthrowing the governments all over the world, etc. <laughs> I think what it makes me the know from Cuba is doing a concrete analysis of your situation as it stands, not being blinded by pre existing suppositions and dicta. Gotcha. Um, one kind of political parallel is with this Bernie Sanders movement, with a lot of people saying they're in favor of what they call Scandinavian social democracy. And we have to our south the Bolivarian revolution, which tried to at least ostensibly put that model into place with a welfare state for Latin America. And I was wondering what sort of consciousness building or example or perhaps guidance from mistakes could be derived from that, if you have any. From Venezuela? Venezuela, but also the rest of the uh, countries, so Bolivia with Evo Morales and um, the other developments that happened in Brazil. Oh, I see. Well, I don't know. I mean, even with all their problems, they're a bit further down the road than we are in this country. So I think it might be presumptuous of me to speak about them when I'm in the midst of the left that, as I keep saying, hasn't really been able to get a grasp on its own social conditions. But I, I will say that, that concretely, one of the problems of uh, the left in this country is that because the country is so right-wing, particularly the descendants of the sector, who, as I said, is Dixie, both nine to one, cross-class line for the Republican Party, that it pushes many of us to the left. I mean, excuse me, to the right. Excuse me, it pushes many of us to the right. And therefore, it causes many of our friends on the left to always be looking to critique the Cuban Revolution, the Bolivarian Revolution, etc. Et and it's, to me, just a capitulation to the U.S. right. And... I don't see that to the same degree in our friends in Latin America. That is to say, the pressure from the right. But of course, um, if you look at those particular countries, they were not born in a revolt against the abolition of slavery, as the United States was. They were born promoting the abolition of slavery, such as in Venezuela, for example, such as Cuba. And that makes all the difference in the world. The international unites the human race. My final guest for today is Professor Paul Street. He is a writer with Counterpunch and a variety of other publications. And he has most recently written a column questioning how Fred Hampton of the Black Panthers Party would have reacted to Black Lives Matter, where he traces out the connections between the nonprofit industrial complex, the Ford Foundation, and the individuals who are considered figureheads and leaders of the Black Lives Matter movement, as it calls itself. So be sure to listen in for this one and understand that Street is coming at this with a significant amount of background work having focused particularly on black and brown labor history and the prison industrial complex. In fact, some of his work was utilized later on by Michelle Alexander for her book, The New Jim Crow. So Paul, you recently have written this piece on essay about Black Lives Matter. I was wondering if you could summarize what your observations are and thoughts were about this issue. Oh, well, um, you know, um, I've been following the 
takeover um, of social movements for a long time and observing how much of what passes for a left and much of what seems to be a left movement often ends up uh, boiling down to being a corporatized, uh, taken over um, agent of the nonprofit industrial complex. Uh, and sort of at the same time, um, which is very corporate funded, and at the same time by the Democratic Party, which is who liberal corporatists and uh, nonprofit leaders uh, are affiliated with. They're affiliated typically with the Democratic Party. I know that in some very personal kinds of ways because I have a history in that world. And uh, I was the research director, fundraiser at, the, at an Urban League affiliate for many years in Chicago. And I mean, you know, that's all people know all about that. Um, I don't know, conundrum, that problem of uh, that complex, moveon.org, uh, Jeffrey St. Clair and other left writers, um, uh, exposés on the corporate takeover of much of the environmental uh, movement. Um, I mean, you could just go down the... Uh, the roster of a lot of what we think are progressive and left organizations and find out that they're, they're not, but people have been sort of uh, reluctant to think that way, um, about black lives matter. Um, you know, I think for some obvious kinds of reasons, there's a lot of, um, sense of street credibility about black lives matter. Um, the movement or the hashtag, no one ever actually seems to know exactly what it is, but the, but this 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 slogan um, and loosely affiliated uh, organizations and leaders around that slogan, you know, emerged out of um, some very real uh, and outrageous incidents um, um, of of just blatantly racist killings of young, not always young, but usually young, usually not always male and not always young, but usually young black males. Um, by racist police departments from coast to coast. It's just incredibly nationwide uh, problem. We even had an incident in the middle of Iowa City uh, back in July of 2009. Uh, and in fact, by some statistical accounts I've seen, there's one of these every uh, 28 hours of um, an unarmed black civilian being shot down by a cop, usually sometimes a security guard or, and on rare occasions. So vigilante and the shooters are usually always white and they're usually always exonerated. And uh, the, 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 the hashtag, the phrase Black Lives Matter, uh, was it Alicia Garza, who's a veteran, nonprofit careerist, um, and her her friend uh, Patrice Calours, I think it is, another veteran nonprofit career activist. Uh, they came up with this hashtag, really turned it into a marketing slogan that became adopted by a lot of the really good and, and uh, protests, protests that I participated in, um, in Chicago and in Iowa City, protests of these killings and these exonerations, uh, which are just ridiculously ubiquitous and endemic across the United States to this day. Uh, we don't even have a fully reliable statistical database on how many of these killings there are people who are keeping track in, in part since Black Lives Matter. Uh, and like I said before, I've, I've, I've read accounts where they, there's an average of one of these every 28 hours. And it's just absolutely outrageous. And again, who's, who's not against that? So we're all against that. And, um, and, um, and then I started having these kind of weird kind of experiences uh, with the protest movement that got me kind of thinking and wondering about how progressive and how left uh, this really was. There was this kind of um, opening phase here in Iowa City. I don't write about this in the article, but I'm just sort of relating that here personally. This kind of opening phase of protests that were very fluid and more community-based, more working class connected, more connected to the southeast side of this town where the black, lower, and working class lives um and there were some interesting marches in the streets and they were multiracial and they felt militant and they felt radical and over time i noticed that the the movement here and i'm fully aware of black lives matter whatever we want to call it this protest movement against these killings takes different forms and different flavors and 
very many different communities across the country. I mean, this, this is a predominantly white campus down, certainly not Ferguson, uh, uh, Missouri. And uh, over time, they got less fluid, less militant, less interracial, less working class, less uh, church-based in terms of the black community, a lot of the in, in indigenous black organization here would be around the black community, tended to migrate more towards the campus. Um, and tended to become, um, I don't know, much more identity politicized, both around gay identity, female lesbian identity, and around black identity, and became much more sort of exclusivist. Uh, now, I, I don't think whites should be running Black Lives Matter. I was always sort of intensely conscious of the fact that I'm a, a, a helper and a, a, and a company or a, and a sister for the early Black Lives Matter movement, and that by virtue of the color of my skin, I shouldn't be a leader of it at all, and I wasn't trying to be. But it became more sort of, um, oh, I've heard the phrase blankety black, you know, it, it became more just sort of, you got absolutely nothing uh, to say at all at these things. And I mean, I, I got a sort of real smackdown from a white feminist graduate student, a female, when I just, I, I finally got tired at one of the demonstrations of the eight times saying, if we're not careful, this could happen in Iowa City. That is, but by this meaning the shooting of a black, of a young black man. And, you know, I finally said once, well, he did. His name was John Dior Ding. Uh, and it happened in the summer of 2009, right here in downtown Iowa City. It was horrible. And we protested it. And it's like nobody even knew about it or even didn't care about it. Maybe part of the problem was that John Ding was Sudanese. So he's actually African, not African-American. I don't know. Uh, but I mean, I, I remember that's the one thing I said, and I, I sort of immediately got to talk to, you know, this is not a white man's rally. I was like, I'm not trying to make it one. I'm just pointing, this is a point of local history information. You know, what was that shooting? I mean, awful, horrible, awful racist shooting of a young black man here. And that was just kind of the energy. And it was, and, um, oh, it's even more complicated than that. And then I, I remember at one point, some young uh, uh, black female professor pretty much got up and said, uh, you white folks can pretty much just walk away from this thing now completely. We've got it. We're negotiating with the city uh, to get $50,000 for officer training so that the cops will be more sensitive and nicer around here, as if that was some sort of great militant, you know, great demand. Well, you know, negotiating with the city, I found out later, and shaking down for some money, and that meant not wanting to piss off uh, the state's county attorney, Janet Reitig, who had produced a report that was a complete whitewash of the killing of uh, John Dior. Dang, so, you know, that was, um, you know, that's, a, that, that's sort of a sticky little story there, but it just sort of got me thinking, you know? And also that the nature, this ritualized expressions of identity that took place as the movement moved towards the campus, and the leaders would just come in and call people out to come out and state their, you know, I am... I am black, I am female, I am gay. And it was just, it became these ritualized expressions of identity instead of an actual confrontation with the police state, as far as I could particularly tell. So I started wondering about this. Is this becoming more and more campus-oriented and more and more identity politicized and less and less militant? And then I read an essay that Alicia Garza published in Feminist Wire, which was just positively, prickly, uh, in ways that struck me that no actual leftist would ever be just positively prickly and kind of mean spirited about anyone else using the phrase like, like Chicano taking it and using brown lives matter um, or working class whites taking it to say our lives matter, you know, or anyone that would say all lives matter. I was never one of these people who, who accused the phrase black lives matter of being racist. I always thought that was a ridiculous charge of of course when you say black lives matter you're not saying that anyone else's life don't matter it's it's consistent with thinking that all lives matter but I, it just struck me as very odd that the way she expressed it that anyone else takes the phrase lives matter um is stealing the work and the creativity she said a queer black woman i mean it's almost like she wanted a license sympathy for this hashtag for this phrase and, you know, the fact is that all kinds of people living under capitalism, which is a completely alienating system, even for white working class people, are told every day by their bosses, 
by the society, by the images they see in the mainstream media, by the politics of this country. I mean, you just go down the list. The majority of the population is constantly told that their lives don't matter, and they want to hear that their lives uh, matter. And I would think any leftist would want to would give the phrase away to everybody, you know, and and and. With, and, and it wouldn't have to mean sacrificing your understanding that there's a specific type of oppression experienced by African American people, particularly in relationship to the racist criminal justice system. I sort of had all these kinds of thoughts in my head, and I forgot about it for a while, and I got caught up in the Laquan McDonald thing in Chicago, and was at some protest about that, and wrote about that, and got involved in a lot of the, uh, the election took over, and I got thinking about that. And then I heard, and then I heard Patrice Kalur is one of the major BLM people speak in Iowa City last February, and it was all very tepid and very tame and very uh, uh, not particularly critical of, of anything except Trump and sort of seemed to be giving a free pass to Hillary Clinton. She said she went into a major depression for two weeks because Hillary Clinton lost, and uh, again, nothing about the class system, nothing about the empire, nothing about the things that leftists have always talked about. Uh, and at the same point, I started thinking of the comparison with the Black Panthers and the feminist woman in the Kochambi, um, I'm probably mispronouncing that, we were collective socialist feminist black-led female collective in 1977, and how these groups openly, particularly the Panthers, openly um, embraced working class solidarity, and then they weren't trying to like coin or patent or or get a licensing free on a phrase, and and they, they they said black power the Panthers did, uh, but they also said power to the people, and they worked with working class whites and working class Puerto Ricans and working class Hispanics to try and encourage them to join, A, join with them in solidarity and to organize around their own particular uh, ethnic, but also working class um, identities, you know, and they talked about, imagine this, things like a proletarian revolution, which is we drastically needed in this country back then, and we still need it now. And uh, it's all very different. And so I was thinking all these thoughts and then found out last year uh, on the eve of the election in August of 2016, that the Ford Foundation, of all co-optive uh, neoliberal corporate agencies in the world, had it earmarked $100 million for Black Lives Matter. Um, and it sort of made a certain kind of amount of sense to me that, that they had. You don't get $100 million uh, from the Ford Foundation. I used to be in the fundraiser. I, I, I know the nonprofit sector. I used to be in it. I know the sort of bourgeois neoliberal world of fundraising, and that is a stupendous, gigantic, monumental grant of money, and, and, and you don't get it. And the, all the affiliated organizations that are getting money uh, under the rubric of BLM through the Ford Foundation grant, which is you know includes money from a number of the other sort of standby corporate neoliberal foundations, get that money by being a revolutionary threat to. Uh, to white supremacy or to the capitalist system or to the empire or any of those kinds of things. You don't you don't get that money by um, fulfilling uh, Dr. Martin Luther King's call for the radical reconstruction of society, right? I mean, by going for a revolution. You get it by um, sitting in and sort of giving a progressive spin and a progressive flavor to Democratic Party policy initiatives and Democratic Party political machines at the, at the uh, local and, 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 and the urban level. And you become, and you understand when you get that kind of money, and the different constituent organizations who get that money, understand that that's their bread and butter, right, is external uh, foundation money from, frankly, the white ruling class. Um, and not mass membership, right? Not, not It's not like a rank and file union where union officers have to actually do something for the rank and file. It's the rank and file who are really not particularly present in uh, a lot of Black Lives Matter organizations and chapters and, 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 and publicity events and so forth. That's not who's calling the shots, right? It's, it's, it's program officers 
at the Borealis, <laughs> you know, company, uh, which is the sort of the intermediary in some ways for the Ford Foundation money. Program officers at Ford and program. I mean, I, I know what it's like to be beholden to program officers and when, and when you're doing their bidding. And sometimes they want to do good things. I get good things with program officer money, with foundation money. Um, but th- th- they're calling the shots. You, 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 you're you not going to go back to them and get any more money from them and to keep your salary going if you're uh, organizing the rank and file population for grassroots activism. So we need grassroots activism. The Ford Foundation is not going to uh, it's not going to pay for the revolution. So, one no, of... That's a, that's a long answer. <laughs> but it's a good one, and it brings up... In retrospect. <laughs> it brings forward a uh, kind of ideological question that occurs sure. to me. Um, it seems, from what I've seen, you know, you've got on one polarity someone like Robin D.G. Kelly, and I've seen lectures by him on, I mean, there is activity going on in this country, and whether it's totally autonomous from Black Lives Matter or it uses that slogan as a banner and lifts it up. Oh, yeah. I mean, this is a pretty heterogeneous thing, but on one poll, you've got someone like D.G. Kelly and other people who follow the uh, sort of Cedric J. Robinson, Black Marxism type of uh, solidarity and critique of capital and what they call racial capital. Um, but then on the other polarity, you have what's called Afro-pessimism. And I wonder uh, what your interaction with that philosophy and that orientation has been, because it's... Well, you're going to have to define Afro-pessimism to me, because I've, I guess I've heard that once or twice, but... Uh... Uh, inadvertently, I'm not. I'm not cognizant of the full meaning of that term. It's an interesting thing that comes uh, to the surface most prominently, in fact, with the case of Ta-Nehisi Coates, and I've seen mm. several uh, black intellectuals that we follow critiquing Coates and his writing through the lens of saying this is kind of his Afro pessimist thinking at its fullest uh, kind of metastasizing point. Um, it's around the notion of the, I- the identity of being human, of having humanity, is something that is essentially a white supremacist concept. And so solidarity on the basis of humanism and shared humanity is fundamentally an impossibility because it is uh, an idea that comes out of a tradition that always was white supremacist and can never be moved in a direction away from that. Well, okay. So, you know, I, I personally have sort of gotten, it's interesting to hear you describe that that way. Um, that might be a prism uh, to, to sort of help me understand some of the responses I've had from people who identify uh, with Black Lives Matter um, here in town. What, one in particular, and certainly not going to name any kind of name, but what sort of emerged from it was the, um, the, the sense that I got from some very angry statements that were directed my way. This was primarily on social media, but some of, the, some of it's in person too is that really um, a white leftist essentially brings absolutely nothing to the table whatsoever uh, of of this discussion. And at at the most, the role might be to sort of stand on the outskirts and sort of clap hands applaudingly. And then, you know, I mean, some of which I understand. And I I sort of, but but it sort of came with a kind of a a, a hostility and uh, a denunciation of the left project uh, in this particular local environment that I had as um, dysfunctional and and, uh, and just sort of inherently bad. And, and yeah, it's, it, from the thing of it, it, it seems very pessimistic, right? It's, 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 um, it's disinterested in, it seems, it, it, it's a mindset that seems to have no sense of a possibility of solidarity hmm. uh, across 
racial lines. It's like it wouldn't even be worth trying. And that's, that's very different than what Fred Hampton talked about in Chicago in 1969 before he was killed. It's very different from what the Panthers talked about in Oakland and across the country in the late 1960s. I mean, Fred Hampton said, we're not, you know, we're, we're not going to fight the fire of white racism with the fire of black racism. We're going to put out the fire of racial division and unite to, to defeat capitalism with the water of solidarity. Um, you do hear this kind of buzzword about intersectionality from some BLM people, and I, I kind of like the buzzword. It makes sense to me. And I've looked at my writing over the years, and it's been all very much about, I, I talk a lot about the uh, Dr. King's combined and interrelated evils, right? Capitalism, but also racism, but also imperialism. It's the big one of them. We're against all institutional um, uh, oppression structures, and they're all dialectically, inseparably linked up with one another, almost like a simultaneous equation system. I, I've written about this many times, and I also said if King was alive today, he'd update it to include sexism, um, gender orientationism, uh, and ecocide. So you talk about how those are also inseparable and in, internally. So we like the term, but in practice, um, it just seems like class, which would mean you know, if you're really interested about class, then you'd have to really sort of think critically about really are white people struggling with bad health and unemployment and technical displacement and being in three months behind on their, on their payments out of the trailer court park. Are they really all that privileged? I mean, they're also within an oppression structure. We're really intersectional. You deal with the class oppression of everybody. Um, and I, I find that that intersectionalism seems to end up sort of being a buzzword. Um, that, um, I don't know, the class part of it seems to get kicked to the side. Certainly when Patrice Kalours came here to Iowa City, nothing she said uh, in this Trump state, right, where a lot of white working class people voted for Trump, nothing pointed any of the kids in the audience at all to the need to try and reach out beyond just this little blue campus town bubble, this identity politicized. Uh, uh, Black Lives Matter, gay-friendly, LGBT-friendly campus town and reach out to and try and make some kinds of connections like the Panthers said had to be done with white working class people. It's just a complete lack of uh, interest in that altogether. So I'm afraid there is, um, if, if that's what it is, if what you're calling Afro-pessimism, I, I have picked up some Afro-pessimism here. Right. Um, but God knows you're going to have some pessimism in Iowa. This, these are about as white as uh, white people can get, and there's a lot of white, white hostility, a lot of seething white anger here, and a lot of sort of bitchy responses, you know, to the phrase Black Lives Matter, and a lot of, you know, false thinking that that's a racist phrase. As I said, I don't think it is. Right. So, let's back up to a kind of macro view, because we've got, it's a hundred years since the Bolsheviks took power, and they did so in a way... <laughs> that was quite intentionally based around anti-colonial national liberation on this worldwide level. And Lenin and his whole movement broke with the pre-existing socialists and became communists precisely because of imperialism and racism. Um, mm -hmm. So then it's 50 years since the Black Panthers issued their 10 point program. MLK gives the Beyond Vietnam speech. Uh, Nkrumah is in power 50 years ago. And then 40 years since the Combahee River Collective's manifesto. And what do you think this says about the cause of black liberation that we've gone from that kind of polarity in the centennial and that half century to another where the Ford Fraud Foundation is propping up things? <laughs> Well, okay, um, you know, um, it's a different era. Um, I don't know how much credit I give Lenin and the Bolsheviks, per se, around the cause of black liberation at the time. There's obviously uh, a big interest in dismantling the British Empire uh, when the Bolsheviks come in, and that includes, of course, their um, African colonial empire, so black, the black nations. Uh, I think in this country, the Communist Party um, really kind of discovers um, 
the black population and the need for for to cultivate and connect with and 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 develop a black rebellion, which they do sort of sometimes tend to call it anti-colonial and sometimes a national rebellion, thinking particularly of the black belt in the South. Uh, I think they discover that in a, in a big way in the 20s and the 1930s, particularly on the Scottsboro Boys, legal defense, and then um, other legal incidents like that. And um, also with the need to organize black workers in, who are very strategically located in key work departments and in all kinds of industries, not just in the South, but actually increasingly after World War One in the North, like the killing floors and the packing houses of Chicago and Omaha and Kansas City, like the foundries and the auto plants at Detroit, um, and like the blast furnaces and the steel mills in Chicago and Pittsburgh and Manita Valley and so forth. And they relate to communists really become sort of the vanguard um, out of their understanding of the need for working class solidarity of the struggle against racism, um, you know, in, in, in this country. And they're wiped out. The communists are wiped out. The leading agents of rank and file anti-racism and struggle against racism. Um, in, in part because they're morally opposed to racism, but also for very practical and pragmatic reasons. They're trying to build a working class movement. And they know that they can't have it when, when blacks are being recruited as strike breakers and when employers are free to deploy racial divide and rule. I mean, they have these very practical organizational kinds of reasons to want to organize black workers. And I think that also many of them really are sincerely anti racist. You know, I think being a radical in America too sometimes helps people be anti racist because it creates a kind of empathetic, empathic experience. Uh, because you're demonized and you're you're treated as as uh, inferior in a way in professions and in academia and in all kinds of places you're sort of on the defensive. It's not the same as being black or Latino, but it it has its own particular kind of um, aspects. I had a very uh, interesting history of uh, 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 a gay communist history professor named Marvin Rosen at Northern Illinois University um, in the 1970s, and he told a class once. Uh, mostly heterosexual class of people that that he that it was much more difficult. He said to be a Marxist in America than it was for him to be gay in America. And and, and at first nobody could believe it. And tell you, after three decades of being a uh, uh, you know four decades plus of being a Marxist, I, I wonder if he was right about that. And so you know there was all these interesting things that happened with the Communist Party around race, and the Communist Party was just wiped out in the forties and the nineteen fifties. By the, by the McCarthy era, just like the Eugene Debs Socialist Party and a lot of the lobbies and the syndicalists, along with some early communists, were just wiped out by the, by the Red Scare during and after World War One. They had the Panthers in the 60s, again, sort of uniting anti-racism with Marxism-Leninism, though, interestingly, at this time, that happening organically from within the black community, starting in Oakland and starting with people like Huey Newton, who had read Franz Fanon and Malcolm X and W.E.B. Du Bois and, uh, and, and other black radical writers. And they get crushed by and large because uh, they really were a revolutionary movement and they, they are destroyed uh, in, to no small extent by COINTELPRO and by, uh, by organized police state. I mean, in my own hometown of Chicago, they just flat out uh, uh, no holds barred police state assassination of, of, of the charismatic young Panther Fred Hampton by uh, on the orders of Cook County State's Attorney Ed Harahan. It was a flat out murder, and everybody knew it. Um, now you know, and so those organic left forces were crushed in this country. We've been paying the price ever since. Um, I don't think Ford Foundation, which is a venerable ruling class sort of philanthro capitalist agency with ties to the CIA and the foreign policy establishment going back to the 30s. And by the way, it's not the Ford Motor Company. It, it, it started out of the Ford Motor Company, but but it's no longer directly tied to it. it anyway, it's an elite foundation um, uh, uh, from what used to be the corporate liberal uh, capitalist league, which is now the corporate neoliberal capitalist. I don't think they hatched BLM. I don't think BLM is their product. I think BLM emerged organically. Uh, I think the protest against the killings of Trayvon Martin and, and um, Mike Brown and Eric Garner and then later Laquan McDonald. I mean, the list of the names that people 
shot down by American police, just goes on and on. I think that emerged organically. Then these sort of careerists came in and saw an opportunity to advance the cause. They had an, an incredibly potent and clever hashtag, Black Lives Matter. Uh, and the protests mediated through social media to no small extent, got great media attention, um, um, got a lot of support from liberals being against the most egregious forms of racism, a big part of liberal middle class identity, white identity, lakefront liberal identity, campus down identity. And it really became kind of a thing. And I think that's when Ford sort of decided that they wanted to uh, get into that, or maybe some of the program officers at Ford and their various constituents uh, and allied you know, entities and foundations. Uh, some of them probably motivated out of real idealism, and some of them motivated perhaps out of a sense that this could get out of control and become dangerous and become something that we don't really want to see in this country, so we better try and shape it um, and influence it. And I, I think that, you know, that's what happened. Well, the Ford Foundation is not new. The Ford Foundation, uh, I think, goes back to the 30s and 40s, and I know that it became a big player in post-war America around urban renewal and uh, played a role in Detroit um, and in other cities that were stung by riots in the 60s, sparked by what? What would right, but what racial violence has usually been sparked by, by in American history, the, the killing of some black people by usually by white police. A number of riots um, and, and one big one in Detroit and Ford came in and uh, 67 was a gigantic riot involved uh, the deployment of National Guard and U.S. Army troops, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken. I'm old enough, I remember U.S. Army deployments in Chicago. In Chicago, on the south side, following the, the killing of Dr. Martin Luther King. And they came in and tried to sponsor business development and to encourage and create a black middle class and a, a black business class. Black capitalism, which, by the way, uh, Black Lives Matter has embraced uh, to some degree with by, by um, putting together a, a black business database for, for people to know where to consult black businesses and by doing some partnership with a leading black bank around a special uh, debit card, a visa debit card that's affiliated with Black Lives Matter. So, I mean, I think that, um, I don't think Ford is just the creator of Black Lives Matter, but uh, times have changed. And between those old eras you're talking about and now, we've had the emergence of what the very... Uh, interesting and incisive historian Nancy Fraser calls progressive neoliberalism, which sounds like an oxymoron, but it's actually this kind of perverse co-joining of, of um, sort of so-called social movement, um, anti-racism, anti-sexism, anti-homophobia, you know, human rights campaign, um, with the neoliberal um uh, capitalist, global capitalist agenda is sort of, in many ways, the, the, what she calls progressive neoliberalism. It's this kind of merging of identity politics with the corporate agenda that's sort of been the hegemonic force in the Democratic Party, I would say probably since Bill Clinton came in and won the presidency in uh, 1992 and certainly up through, uh, through the Obama years. And I right. think this formation what Professor Fraser calls progressive neoliberalism kind of went down in smoking defeat uh, and got defeated by the reactionary white nationalist populism of Donald Trump uh, just about a year ago. Right. Exactly. Yeah. And it, what's interesting, I mean, uh, just to clarify, I don't think anyone would be trying to argue unless they lived in Breitbartland that Black <laughs> Lives Matter is completely formulated by uh, the Ford Foundation or some other right. big capitalist thing. But I think the fact you mentioned COINTEL Pro and the snuffing out of so many progressive revolutionary movements in the aftermath of World War II, I think the paradigm of how the power structure is going to handle these issues, they used to try to snuff them out, now they're going to try to buy them out. Yeah. Yeah, which is not entirely new either. Like I said, Ford Foundation was very active in urban America, um, and other foundations were all wrapped up in sort of uh, uh, trying to create some semblance of a black middle class and and avenues for uh, you know so so that basically uh, 
young black professionals would grow up uh, not reading Malcolm X and Francis Fanon, but rather trying to find a way to uh, fit into this this sort of neo, new neoliberal system that emerged after Vietnam. I would say, but you know, you said after World War II, um, that, that's the destruction of the communists by and large. But there's also, a, 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 I think, a remarkable assault on uh, the types of left that might not have been quite as beholden to the changing party line emanating from Moscow uh, after World War I. Uh, you know, the Red Scare, I think, in, in many ways, the uh, industrial workers of the world and the socialists, the, the, the original American U.S. Socialist Party, were, were decimated as well, mm. um, you know, after that period. Okay. After World War I. I think there's been a couple of sort of, well, there's been sort of three right ways of left destruction in this country. The, the, the Red Scare after World War One. The McCarthy era, which really targeted the CPUSA, uh, and then the Cointel Pro era, which targeted the Black Panthers and uh, and the New Left. Right. So simultaneous with all of these developments, we also just have gone through the massive public spectacle of the Ken Burns mega series on PBS <laughs> about Vietnam. Yeah. Uh, and that's also funded by the Ford Foundation and and other foundations. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, inc right. including one of the Koch brothers. And you sure. understand history as a discipline and an art. And what do you think it says that we have the Ford Foundation telling a history that acknowledges and even gives credit to the anti-war movement? Because unlike an amateur, in my mind, someone like Steve Bannon, whose nutty documentaries essentially blame the 60s for everything, you've got a very different modus yeah, operandi yeah. here, and I think we should give some analysis to it and how you complement in order to co-opt. Well, you know, the corporate neoliberal elite now is just full of, of, of folks who were, um, some of whom may have participated in the Berkeley, the Berkeley Free Speech Movement in the 60s. I guess most of those people are already near retirement age or at retirement age, right? But it's full of, uh, of uh, upper middle class professionals and upper class uh, funders that uh, that were opposed to the Vietnam War and that were supportive of Dr. King and the Civil Rights Movement in that time. And you know, I um, again, I'm not, I'm, I don't want to exaggerate how new some of this is. You know, Ken Burns um, is a um, is a, a product of a liberal campus town, Ann Arbor. He went to my high school, Pioneer High. In Ann Arbor, he was quite a few years ahead of me. He grew up uh, in a time when campus towns were uh, organized against the Vietnam War. He talks about attending a teach-in. I think it was 1967, somewhere on the University of Michigan campus at that time. But there were all these different sort of strands of opposition to the Vietnam War, and there were different sort of shades of it. Um, and, and Burns is been a guy who um, has been very strategic and very calculating. I mean, follow the money on Ken Burns. He has become sort of almost like the nation's sort of official neoliberal uh, historian. I mean, the history profession, I, I think, sort of bears some responsibility for the ascendancy of, uh, of Ken Burns. They complain all the time about people not knowing history, but they do very little to, to have a public presence in it. And it just kind of leaves the field open for this kind of uh, slimy foundation that PBS, I always put the P in PBS in quote marks, PBS connected um, uh, liberal slash neoliberal historian Burns. And you know what really happened in the Burns documentary is just, the, is just another iteration of what was the official liberal kind of position on the Vietnam War in the 1960s, which was that it wasn't, um, that it was a mistake, right? And that it was kind of an imperial miscalculation. It came out of good intentions, good intentions that were rooted in a Cold War uh, conflict. They were motivated by an attempt to stem the uh, ever advancing onrush of the uh, communist menace. But, you know, then they just got in over their heads and they made a lot of strategic mistakes and they didn't know what they were doing and they didn't properly calculate uh, uh, public opinion in the South Vietnamese countryside and they underestimated the North Vietnamese enemies and they overestimated their South Vietnamese allies 
And then they just got in too deep and, and, you know, and LBJ went absolutely crazy and it was horrible and it was bad, but it was all a mistake and it was a well-intended mistake and a lot of people died for no good reason. And there's all this energy about the 57,000 American troops, 58,000 American troops that died, relatively little, about the 5 million Southeast Asians had lost their lives between 1962 and 1975, not because of Vietnam War, but because of what they call an American properly, an American invasion, right? I mean, it was the, it's known in, in that part of the world as the American War for some very good reasons. I mean, they dropped more bombs on that region in just a couple of years than were dropped by everybody, okay, in, in during, during World War II and the Korean War combined. And, you know, that's a very different position than what the actual real serious new left said in the 1960s, led by people like Noam Chomsky and Howard Zinn and, and others, which was, it was a crime. I mean, there was an abject crime, not motivated, not out of uh, uh, any particularly defensive desire to keep back the communists. Words, but to stop the national independence and revolutionary socialist people's movement from breaking off from imperial, from Western and imperial control, that it was it was imperial, militantly imperial, um, and it was about you know uh, the, 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 the stopping the um, uh, um, people of Vietnam from creating a just society outside of out of outside of the control of Washington and London and Paris. And to become a role model for other third world countries to do the same, to do the same thing. That that was a motivation, and that the, the mecha- and that the mechanisms uh, of of response were criminal in nature, damn near genocidal. And you know, the, the, the funny part of what Chomsky says is that, is that the West won in some ways. They really did pulverize Vietnam so badly uh, that the lesson was very clear to the rest of the world that if you get seriously, you take on Uncle Sam. And, 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 and you want to break off from his control, we will bomb you back to the Stone Age. You know, and all these many decades later, in many ways, Vietnam has sort of been re- reintegrated into the world capitalist system. That's the reality of it. Mm. That's the reality. An imperial crime uh, that in, in some measure was oddly successful. Maximum objectives, U.S. objectives, were not, were not achieved, okay? It was not unified. Uh, Vietnam under capitalist control, under the control of Saigon, and with, with, you know, as a U.S. puppet, did not even maintain the territorial integrity of South Vietnam. But the minimal objectives, and, and the minimal objectives are actually the biggest objectives, ironically enough, of stopping Vietnam from becoming a, um, a, a role model, uh, a, a, a demonstration effect for how you can really create a better and just world with, within it, with, with the national socialist revolution. I, I think that was achieved. And these are the kinds of things that Ken Burns would never talk about. It was, well, we failed. It was a defeat. We lost. You know, he calls it the Vietnam War when it wasn't. It was the American War on Vietnam. Uh, and he plays into this whole kind of uh, well-intended mistake narrative, right? Right. And unfortunately, while there is some, there are some references in the documentary, obviously, to what happened to the Vietnamese, um, the, the, the 5 million Southeast Asians, I've seen some estimates of, of that many killed when you include La, La, Laos and Cambodia, uh, pale by comparison to the 57,000 Americans who lost their lives. And that's unfortunate. But no, there is space to have been against the Vietnam War. Okay. Um, and, uh, and there are many people in policy making positions now of, of, you know, in the 60s and the 70s who were opposed to the Vietnam War. There's space for being technically opposed to the Vietnam War. And even having marched against the Vietnam War in the 60s without having a real fundamental underlying critique of American imperialism like the real hardcore in the left hand. Right. So I'm not surprised that Burns could be giving legitimacy to the 60s while actually whitewashing American U.S. imperial policy. That's what they do. Um, and that's part of the rebranding. So, so the, the, the Clintons were against the, were, 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 I think they both marched. They both spoke against the Vietnam War and proceeded to grow up and become uh, sold out baby boomer policymaker elites from Oxford and Yale Law who, uh, who conducted illegal uh, uh, wars um, around the world and, and bombed the hell out of Serbia for no particular good, good legitimate reason. Right. 
Now, yeah. I think the Clintons also significantly impacted neoliberalism establishing hegemony in this country because you'd had Carter and Reagan and Bush who were these kinds of old school, typical 1950s, waspy sort of, uh, mm -hmm. you know, my grandfather's country club types. And then you have these two people who come out and they're saying, oh yeah, we were against the war and we were on the McGovern campaign and, you know, I did not inhale and I went to Oxford to avoid the draft. And, and Jeffrey St. Clair yeah. says in interviews, you know, it's under the Clintons that two of Reagan's major dreams, the crime omnibus bill and the destruction of welfare are, uh, initiated and NAFTA is passed. I mean, right, right. Yeah. Yeah. Here come the, here come these, um, here come these young, the first baby boomer, uh, presidential pair, you know, and Bill always said we were co-presidents and it was always kind of understood in the inner circle that well, those are highly intelligent people. That was highly intelligent too. We're talking Yale law here, not just Harvard law, uh, and top of the class too, and particularly in Hillary state, very smart, very intelligent, very professional class. Um, very much products of the meritocracy and sort of victors of the, of, the, of the meritocracy. And, you know, that's another sort of hidden dimension of this, what this Democratic Party uh, of, of our lifetimes is, is about, is very much catering to uh, the sort of the elite professional class and its sort of meritocratic values. And, you know, that was going on Obama, too, sort of epitomes of the Ivy League meritocracy with these kind of, yeah, progressive-sounding bona fides from the 60s with a hint of multiculturalism um, about them with black allies and with black people in their administration. George Bush also had a surprisingly multiracial administration, you know, and all of that kind of energy around them and then coming in and proceeding to um, enact the corporate neoliberal agenda in a way that, that very possibly um, uh, a Republican could not have gotten away with, right? I mean, uh, um, uh, the, 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 the decimation of manu the further decimation of manufacturing through the so-called free trade, which is really an investor rights, you know, you know, trade agreement with Mexico. Um, um, the, 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 the combining with Newt Gingrich and the right wing Republicans to finally carry out the right wing dream of taking away the entitlement to basic family cash assistance for a poor, Black, poor Latino, poor white, for poor families in this country. Incredible of the Three Strikes Crimes Bill, which is a major boon for racist mass incarceration, right, and prison building, and the development of the police in the, in the prison state, and also the deregulation of uh, of derivatives. Uh, you know, Wall Street's a dream, and the um, the breaking up, the, the the dismantling, the working with Republicans to to uh, tear up the Glass-Steagall Act, which had maintained a wall of separation between commercial and investment banking, and just unleashing uh, these neoliberal forces. Absolutely. They did that uh, under the veneer of, um, of this kind of uh, fake progressivism, or what Nancy Fraser calls progressive neoliberalism. Right? Right. And there's a gender aspect to it, too, with the very, and the, the first really sort of uh, empowered first lady who was sort of put in charge from the beginning of a uh, health care policy, right? Right. And yeah. And, you know, it proceeded to then destroy uh, of the movement for single payer insurance in this country for, uh, you know, for a decade. And, you know, and sometimes you get the reenactment of all of this in, a, in an age of capitalist crisis and financial meltdown with Barack Obama. Right. And, yeah. um, you know, one of the, th kind of cultural artifacts from the 1990s that I think best sums up and epitomizes that entire thing was the film Forrest Gump. And uh, Forrest Gump, yeah. I mean, there's a lot of that uh, kind of zelig motif with the way they've got him appearing in these great moments of 1960s radicalism and 1970s kind of you know, post-Vietnam era, but sure. it's got a very right. conservative and pretty 
strikingly racist ideology underwriting it throughout. Right. With the main... You know, Bill and Hillary almost become like, you know, they're almost sort of like the epitome of the anti-war protesters that all the, the Nixon silent majority, you know, completely hate it, right? And then they sort of get in there and, uh, you know, carry out this, this sort of elitist agenda, and which helps the white working and lower middle class uh, become, you know, more and more Republican. And, you know, sort of it, 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 it all becomes part of the... Um, you know, it all becomes part of the uh, the hating of them, um, you know, around Monica Lewinsky and uh, the loose sexual morals of the wild bill down in Little Rock and in Washington. And it all just sort of becomes part of this shadow reenactment of this generational hatred, um, you know, um, this sort of town-city conflict, cosmopolitan versus, uh, versus, you know, analog versus digital America kind of blue state, red state divide. And, 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 you know, and, and, you know, they, 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 the the Clintons were supposed to be friendly towards gay rights and Clinton had a gay female as his attorney general for, for many years, they were associated sort of liberal, uh, progressive, multicultural kind of, uh, uh, forces there. And then meanwhile, behind the scenes, no matter which side of that conflict you're on, and this continues up to this day, you know, uh, whether you're for or against abortion rights, Clintons are for it, Republicans are against. Whether you're for or against gay rights, Clintons are for uh, uh, the Republicans are against. Oh, you know, whichever side of that you're on, whether you're in uh, rural Arkansas or you're in the upper or you're in the lakefront upper north side of liberal, the lakefront liberals of Chicago, the upper west side of Manhattan, no matter which side of that you're on and who you're hating, Goldman Sachs and Citigroup, you know, and Bank of America always win and get what they want. Right. And so let's kind of pivot and talk about the left in America because you argue that there is no such thing existing in America in the recent print issue of Counterpunch. Um, yeah. Now, I bet the opinion that while there are a lot of leftists, the fact is that uh, there's a significant majority of them that are beholden to this kind of popular front notion of politics within the Democratic Party that, you know, we call today lesser evil voting. And it spans mm. the spectrum from, you know, the Democratic Socialists of America, which has apparently seen a huge blossoming and expansion ever since the Sanders campaign, to the Communist Party USA. And there's even a significant section of the Green Party that does go towards that kind of lesser evil paradigm, and they did it in 2004. Um, do you think this is because people are holding out hope of pushing the Democrats to the left, or perhaps because, truth be told, there really is no one alive anywhere, anymore who remembers huh. the Debs campaigns or anything that predated the popular front, meaning the issue is not numbers as much as lack of imagination? I mean, obviously... Angela Davis and Gus Hall and Peter Camejo and Nader running uh, both in the 70s and in the 2000s did create that space. Well, you know, now just to be clear, that's that I'm quoting Chomsky, uh, who in an interview with Dr. David Barsamian actually said, there's no left. I've just been this real book that's coming out so. Uh, I don't know if it's actually out yet, but I had an advanced look at it. A book that's coming out uh, from Haymarket Publishers very soon, if it's not already out. And Nancy Frazier's in there, Mike Davis is in there, and uh, oh, a number of really, Lance Self and other good left authors in there. And sort of, I, I picked that phrase up there, too, that, 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 that there's no real actual uh, functioning left. I just read an interview that Chris Hedges did with the World Socialist website where he essentially said that we really don't have any actual existing functioning left. So I'm, it's, you know, it's hardly uh, a, a, a solitary position on my part. And if you're doing a head count, you know, certainly in the 60s, um, who knows, maybe today. You know, but this is a period of time now in which most 18 to 29 year olds tell pollsters that they have a more favorable response to the word socialism than they do the word capitalism. If you're doing a head count, the problem maybe we have more leftists or people who want to be leftists or who are leftists and don't know it. I don't know. You know, than any time in American history. I mean, we, we, we may have a lot of leftists, but what we don't have is any kind of real 
and even there, I got to qualify this, but we don't really have a dedicated through thick and thin uh, institutional presence that we can really call a left. I mean, in the 19, early 1930s, uh, some white landlord would kick a black family, uh, uh, would evict them, you know, uh, uh, in, in the gallons outside of Chicago. And the mother would tell one of the kids, quick, run and get the reds. And they knew where to go. There was a communist party office somewhere. And by God, some spark plug militias from the financial left, you know, communist party. Not exactly my first choice of the, you know, the greatest ideological orientation of all time, right? But they, they were there. They were, they were, there was a presence. They had limited craft machines. They had telephones. They had an office. And those militants showed up. And by God, they'd organize a rally. And the people would come out of their houses and put those people's belongings and their furniture back in the house and the police would understand that they just might as well leave them alone but they're just going to have a riot on their hands. We don't have anything really like that. Black Lives Matter doesn't do that. You know, the Panthers had a direct and organic relationship with the communities, particularly Oakland, in which they were present. And in Chicago ran adult literacy programs and uh, black history programs and, and the, the famous free breakfast program um, that, that um that Hampton and other Panthers ran. They had a direct organic service relationship in the community. We don't have anything really like that anymore. Now, you know, that's that's what's going away. Mm. You know, and, and, and in connection with those the, the institutions that have a that have a kind of a real deep rooted class analysis and a sort of economic class understanding of the system that we're all up against, right? They have a class understanding of the capitalist uh, 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 oppression structure that's created a situation now where the top tenth of the one percent has more wealth than the, the bottom ninety percent of the population. And we don't really seem to have that. We have all these different uh, different entities around various single issues, and I mean, I, I could go on and on about. Now, I, I want to be careful because there are some good left organizations that are Marxist in orientation that I personally have some respect for. And that, that really do good things, like in Chicago, like the ISO. Uh, Socialist Alternative has some done, done some good things in various cities, including, of course, Seattle, where they have someone sitting on the city council. And I don't know if Solidarity is still around. Um, but it's always been a sort of a strong, I mean, a sort of a sound, you know, left organization. There are IWW chapters in this country. There are lefties. There are some left organizations, but they don't come together in any particular cohesive type of mm. uh, nationwide um, steady institutional presence right now that can do much of anything. You know, popular frontism, I don't know, the popular front is from a different era. It's from the Fordist era. It's from a period of time in which you really could have argued that the Democratic Party was sort of being compelled by the Great Depression and by the fight against fascism and by the rise of the labor movement, industrial workers, you know, to do things that, that were good, you know, that, that needed to be done, like pass the Social Security Act and, and pass the Wagner Act, which legalized union organizing in this country. I think that now the Democratic Party, I mean, you may be in touch with some older, real, you know, old leftists, I am, I mean, who sort of still even know what that phrase means and sort of think in those kinds of terms of the popular front, which is right from the 30s and the 40s. But really now, I think a lot of what you see with um, the Democratic Party is this, what, what is the Nancy Fraser construct? It's, it's sort of this progressive neoliberalism. It's this kind of perverse, um, seemingly oxymoronic, but in fact kind of interesting, and but perverse uh, uh, merging of social movements. Um, many of them around race, around gender, around sexual orientation, around uh, around ecological issues and environmental issues. Sometimes they move on, I think, sort of started around anti-war. I mean, not anti-war, anti the invasion of Iraq. I mean, those are sort of two different things, but anti-Iraq war. You know, all these sort of disparate movements sort of linked in with this party, which still has this kind of rhetorical connection to the popular front era, to the Franklin Delano Roosevelt era, to the anti-fascist era, but which has kind of shed those really um, organic working class connections, those labor connections that used to be at the heart and the soul of the popular front. Those have disappeared. Those have gone a long way. I mean, we're down to the 6% uh, private sector 
union density now, union membership right now. I think it's 11% nationally when you bring in the public. So the unions aren't there anymore. The working class um, uh, institutions aren't there. And sort of what people are sort of caught up with and tied in with is this progressive neoliberalism um, construct. Um, I don't know. I don't know if, if there's some popular frontism about it. I mean, in a way... Bernie Sanders sort of seem to be trying to bring back the popular front, right? Right. Uh, but there's no labor, there's no labor movement anymore. Um, I mean, we think that'd be a good thing if we could get, if we could even get ourselves back to the age of the popular front, right? Um, but I mean, I think you're right that that the, at the end of the day, um, not just Sanders. I mean, obviously Sanders at the end of the day was a was a Democratic Party company man. I mean, uh, um, and, and and he irritated a lot of his own younger supporters because of the extent to which he just was going to play Bill Ball with Hillary Clinton, but even sort of the Greens. Uh, Certainly Joe Stein and the David Cobb wing are sort of very qualified in their their willingness to actually challenge the Democratic Party, you know, and David Cobb with the strategy of um, of uh, only oppose them in, un, in, in states where the Democrats can't, either can't lose or can't win, right? Stay, stay out of contested states. You know, that's really when you get down to it about capitulation to lesser evil, if, if, if not worse. Uh, the DSA has been rising uh, all over the place, but it, it, it doesn't seem to be ready to have any meaningful confrontation with what the Democratic Party is really all about, particularly on the question of empire and the, the question of the um, Pentagon system and the defense budget, which was sort of my main hang-up with Bernie Sanders. I and mean, it's really where Bernie... Across the red, my red lines was his just complete inability to uh, to be at all honest about how if, if if we're going to do good things that he talks about uh, wanting to do like free college tuition, single payer health insurance, and massive green jobs program, that they have to take a very serious look. As Dr. Martin Luther King counseled everybody in 1967, at the uh, at the one machine, he doesn't want to talk about that. He wants to. Talk about Scandinavia again and again and again as his role model, and never mention that Scandinavia spends comparatively minuscule portions of their budgets on the defense system. I don't know if I'm answering your question. No, you are. You are, and I yeah, think. Yeah. I think. Uh, you know, as for Debs, I don't think anybody remembers Debs much anymore. I think that's. I mean, we don't have history. So that's a real problem. We, we we don't have a real historical um, uh, memory in this country. Right, and you know, in terms of. DSA, I, don't, I mean, I don't want to be too sectarian, but uh, there really needs to be a significant coming to terms with the legacy of Harrington and Howe and Russia and, Shackman, right? and Shackman around the Vietnam War and the r way that they really went, were on the wrong side of history with Vietnam, but also the 1968 teacher strike in New York City. Sure, right. You know, and I don't know if that's going to happen organically because they are becoming far less of an elitist, middle-class Manhattan cocktail party kind of organization like they once were in the 70s, or if they are going to just avoid that until the contradiction becomes so obvious. But I think, yeah, I think they're at, well, you know, go ahead. No, well, I think they're at, still at this kind of grassroots identity moment where they're trying to figure out who they are and what they are in regards to Sanders, the democratic party and the notion of inheriting a legacy of, the non-communist left. You know, I, I think that's absolutely right, and I think the situation in those groups is, is, is from what I hear, is, is fluid. You know, I'm, I'm talking about the DSI, mm -hmm. and there are all kinds of different tendencies going on, and people trying to figure out what in the hell they can possibly do in this insane political environment that is neoliberal America. And uh, I think probably the thing for more hardcore leftists to do is probably actually join these groups and find out what they're doing and see if there's work to be done with them and through them. Um, you know, 
I mean, one test here in this town, uh, where I'm talking to you from, Iowa City, is very interesting is to see if they're going to get behind um, this just horrific local neoliberal Democrat, David Lobsack, who's just this kind of mealy-mouthed, mediocre, former political science professor turned uh, opportunistic uh, politician who just very fort luckily uh, fell his way into congressional office in the 2006 wave against against Bush's Iraq war, and um, who I personally followed around during the Iowa caucus in his precinct, the 17th precinct here in Iowa City, and heard him just bad now, Bernie Sanders and Bernie Sanders supporters, and tell everybody that they've got to get behind Hillary Clinton because she's the only possible candidate who can win, and we've got to defeat this socialist who doesn't have a chance, blah, blah, blah. Well, uh, Hillary Clinton was the worst candidate in American political history, or one of them, and it turns out didn't really have all that much chance of a winning, and Sanders probably would have done much better than she did in the presidential election. In fact, I'm I'm guessing Sanders would have actually defeated Donald Trump. So, I mean, if if you're going to call yourself a democratic socialist uh, entity, are you going to go out and knock on doors for this clown? You know, this, this this Judas backstabbing Hillary fan. This was a town that went for Bernie Sanders. Uh, Johnson County and Iowa City went for Bernie uh, for some very good reasons. We've got a lot of college students that vote here who know they have no future under this system. They know it very well. Um, you know, so um, those are the kinds of things that, that will have to be, uh, what it's going to be is going to, is going to be manifest in, in the history that actually occurs, I would say getting behind somebody like that would be an indication that it's going in the wrong direction. There's all kinds of folks, just like there's all kinds of people that show up at that Black Lives Matter rallies or that Black Lives Matter as a slogan. I mean, most of the people who like the hashtag, who've gone to demonstrations or movements or joined chapters, probably don't, uh, don't, uh, couldn't give a rant's ass about the Ford Foundation or any of that. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and I'm fully aware of that. Right. Uh, even though I wrote that kind of snotty piece about him for, in truth, too. Right. Um, so one of the things, and this is really going into the weeds from where we started off, but um, I think it's worth talking about is I've seen several different indications that the left uh, really is doing, instead of focusing on electoral politics or even direct action, there's a concerted effort that focuses around, um, to borrow a phrase, a turn to industry. And uh, you see people like uh, Dr. Richard Wolf put a lot of energy into promoting the notion of worker-owned cooperatives. Uh, The Chinese, of course, they have been adamant that Deng Xiaoping and his entire program was an economic program that had some legitimacy within genuine Leninist thinking, and it was about uh, using capital to build up the country in a way that would be of benefit. And, um, you know, I've seen in Rhode Island where I am, there is still a network of members of the Communist Party who do uh, exist and have red cards and all that stuff, but they are embedded within the labor movement and they're very quiet and they don't wear their politics on their sleeves, but they're the types of people you can rely on if you need a job or if you're in trouble or something like that. And I think, I'm just curious what you think about the idea that. maybe left energy should be put into the economic aspect as opposed to the, you know, directly electoral realm or even... Well, you know, that's really interesting. Um, you know, it's kind of, I'm intrigued by um, this space that is opened up by capital abandonment, by just the total abandonment of the society. Mm-hmm. By, by by capitalism, which is just only going to increase with artificial intelligence and full-on mechanization and sort of the Amazon.com takeover 
of everything. And on one level, it's absolutely horrible. You know, on one level, it's horrifying and scary and, and everything else. And 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 yet on the other level, I mean, it, 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 sort of at the same time, you, it, it sort of poses these very sort of grave existential questions about what we can or might do in those abandoned um, spaces. And you find all kinds of interesting things actually start happening in organic agriculture. Actually, Cuba, in way, in, in a way, both sort of struggling with the U.S.-led embargo and then abandoned in a way by its other great power, well, its great power sponsor, the Soviet Union, when the um, <coughs> Iron Curtain went down, sort of looks inward and develops all these sort of interesting eco-socialist modes of, uh, of, of, of making things, selling things, and, 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 and fueling their structures, and, and sort of they end up being, in many ways, the society with the best combination of, of, of a social health and low carbon footprint in the world. You know, I was down in Cuba a couple uh, a couple of Aprils ago and sort of witnessed some of this. Um, abandonment is not necessarily all bad. Now, what we, you know, with the, the notion of cooperatives and when, where we might actually co- collectively and collaboratively and in a participatory kind of way uh, talk about what we want to make, what we want to, what we want to eat, what we want to wear, how we want to produce these kinds of things, and to do that under democratic conditions, and not under the supervision of some of some uh, distant Wall Street overlord. That's a pretty um, damn good thing, you know. The way workers organize, how workers organize, the labor process um, that we engage in is a very underestimated issue. Most Americans spend the majority, working age Americans, spend the majority of their waking lives under the supervision of a despot. That's why they called in an employer. It's what Marx called the hidden abode of production. How do you have a democratic society when people are spending the great majority of their waking hours uh, under authoritarian supervision and under authoritarian control? Nobody thinks the First Amendment has any relevance whatsoever in workplace, because it really doesn't. And in fact, workplace power and authority crushes First Amendment rights even beyond the workplace, because everybody in this country is scared, not only that they'll lose their job, but that they'll, because of employment-based health care, that they'll lose their, their own health care, their family's health care. They do anything or say anything that their, their employer might find objectionable. So that's a really important thing for us to figure out ways to, uh, to work, you know, and to, and to, to, to achieve income. Um, you know, also what we make, you know, what we do, what our activities are, uh, most working class people don't want to be destroying the environment. They want to be wrecking the streams and the airways and the forests of the, you know, and they, you know, the 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 the, the, the commons, the, the livable ecology of the planet, with with built-in obsolescence, with poison chemicals, with toxic chemicals. Most working people don't want to do that. They were empowered uh, and and included and participated uh, and encouraged to develop uh, knowledge and, and all around skills. In, uh, in their economic lives, they would collectively make better and uh, more environmentally sustainable um, decisions. You know, and, and it's not just industry. Um, you know, it's agriculture, and maybe even particularly agriculture. I'm really sort of heartened by movements for food, food sovereignty. What is more basic than getting control over the growing and the distribution and the and the, uh, and the quality of the, of the food? You know, and that 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 sustains us. These things are very, very, very important. You know, and and either before or after the environmental collapse that seems to be written into the uh, DNA of this profit system, um, we're going to need to take control uh, fundamentally of our of our of our economic lives. Uh, I don't know if that's going to happen through in the ways that uh, Marx talked about in the Communist Manifesto. It's a sort of a great dialectical. Uh, outcome of the development of the bourgeois system, or for in fact, it's more that the bourgeois system is going to abandon us uh, and uh, uh, so completely and destroy our world so completely that we're going to have to hatch alternative, uh, uh, maybe Richard Wolff style worker controlled enterprises uh, uh, beneath and beyond and outside their control, trying to grow those uh, alternative systems sort of within the womb of this, this, this um, cancerous. I mean, that's what capitalism is. You don't know this is a midwife to anything. You know, sort of that was the dialectical Hegelian illusion of Marx and Engels. Very understandable. 
in their time. They saw capitalism as this great uh, progenitor, this dialectical midwife who's going to bring bring into existence this next new highest order, transitionally socialist, and then giving way to the reign of the associated producers, which the associated Marx associated producers is kind of an sort of left anarchist vision of, of worker autonomy. Um, you know, and, 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 and democratically self-managed uh, uh, interaction with nature and with each other within and beyond the workplace. Well, you know, I, I don't know that it's going to happen. And in, in there, there are no laws of history. I think maybe capitalism is hardwired to destroy everything. So can we perhaps hatch an alternative uh, within its interstices uh, of, of, uh, of abandonment? You know, which you sort of see some of in places like Detroit and Chiapas, Mexico, and in a way in Cuba, and there's other examples too. That's all we got for the time for today, folks. Thanks for listening, and tune in next time for another episode of Political Gingivitis. I'm your host, Andrew Stewart, and I want to remind you again America's greatest social democratic period corresponded with the lives of those wonderful commies, Larry, Curly, and Moe. <laughs>